for coming and seeing this week's Wednesday Word. Today is the, it's 17th, the 17th. 17th. Yes. Yes, the 17th of April, 2024. Um, today's topic is the pastor's burden. And before we get into this, in defining it and, and having this discussion, um, thank you for coming. Feel free to uh, like, share, subscribe. Uh, leave a comment below if you have a prayer request. We're more than happy to pray for you, to keep you in our prayers. Um, we got several product endorsements today. <laughs> We've got uh, Subway and, and uh, Hux. Big swig from Big Hux. swig from Hux. Here we go. Because, uh, you know, who needs to cook at home? <laughs> okay. So, pastor's burden. I don't think this is exclusive to pastors, meaning there's other believers that can feel this as well that aren't in ministerial positions. I would agree with you. The burden I have as a pastor, I've had for years, uh, it would wax and wane depending on whatever was going on. Uh, but even when I wasn't a pastor, when I would just sit in a pew, I would have the burden grieving over problems either in the congregation I was in at the time or uh, over the broader church in America, problems that was going on in the church at the time. Uh, and today is a very apt uh, time to discuss it because we've had two, not one, but two significant events go through the evangelical news feed. Uh, one involved a, a situation at a men's conference at a James River Church in yeah. Missouri. We're, we're, yeah, we're going to talk about this in detail here in just a little bit. So before we go any further, let's just define terms, right? Mm -hmm. So the pastor's burden, a feeling that his ministry has no impact or that the task is simply too great. This burden is common among faithful ministers during times of great apostasy. So, when a pastor uh, of a church is continually addressing the same issues in his sermons uh, that he sees in his congregation, and he gets amens, and, and that was a great sermon, pastor, but nothing changes, you feel like you're you're beating your head against a wall. Like, you're preaching to a wall. Like, I mean, you might as well be preaching to an empty church because it's not making an impact at all. My parents, both of my parents had the phrase, you might as well be talking to the four walls. Yeah. Is what they would say when they were frustrated. Usually that was directed at us kids <laughs> when we were not yeah. listening to yeah. what they were saying. Yeah. They would say, I might as well be talking to the four walls. So this, this is common among pastors, but there are... Mm -hmm. um, Christians, believers that are uh, not in ministerial positions that still have these same feelings, especially when you start looking at the macro, when you start looking at what's going on in the world, or you start looking at what's going on nationally, or um, more distinctly, I would s suppose, what's going on in the American church today. Because it seems to me that the American church of my youth is far different than the American church today. It is, it is far different, and I'm not going to say it, it's not gone in the sense that America is gone. There's still a faithful remnant, but it, that faithful remnant is rapidly becoming a, a remnant. We imagine two hurricanes going over the United States. On the East Coast, you've got a hurricane that floods the entire eastern half of the country. On the West Coast, you've got another big hurricane that's flooding the western half, and you just got this thin corridor in the middle that's not underwater. Uh, one of the, the hurricanes is wokeism. The other is the NAR, and there it's just coming in with an overwhelming flood. It's easy to get burdened down and forget that God promises that the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against them. So, so we can become overwhelmed with the pastor's burden over what we see in the macro, but even also 
in the micro, as in my first example, um, uh, where a pastor is addressing an issue in the church and it's not making an impact. But we can also have this in our own lives. And I, I think I have talked about this a bit in the past. Um, there's been an update, something that has really brought it to the surface again. Uh, that came came out just this last weekend. Uh, and, and, and it did affect me for church on Sunday. It did affect me. I was a bit more solemn. So as a pastor, um, it would be hypocritical of me to condemn sin from the pulpit and excuse it in my own family. And my mother is a serial adulterer. Serial. Like, she claims to be a believer. And if you were to meet her, you know her. You know, when you first meet her, you think she's just a nice, sweet Christian woman, but she's, she's not. She's manipulative. She's controlling. She's... Uh, passive aggressive and she's unfaithful and and she's she's now on uh, well she's been married and divorced I think six times and she's she's trucking forward to number seven and, and the most recent marriage which didn't last but I don't even think a year um, maybe maybe a little over a year possibly um, but I told her I said you can't you can't marry. You're not biblically permitted to marry. You can either get married or be right with God. It's one or the other. You cannot marry. You can't. And I told her, I said, if you do this uh, uh, in accordance with Scripture, in, in the right, from the writings of Paul, I am not to even eat with you. Not until you turn from this sin, you repent from it, and so a few weeks ago, I get a phone call from my mother. She had called from a number that I didn't know. And as a pastor and having my number out there, um, you know, I, it's a local number, so I, I answered it. I didn't know who it might be, and, but it was my mother. And she tried to tell me, or began to tell me, that she had got involved in... Uh, uh, with a deliverance ministry and she was uh, seeking deliverance um, and that she has repented of her past uh, uh, sexual immorality, all of this. And, but what she failed to tell me is that she's already in a serious relationship with someone who I guess supposedly is a believer. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about this person. She failed to tell me this. Like this relationship began before the phone call. So it's a lie of omission, but it's more than that. It's more than that. She is uh, in a serious romantic relationship with a man when she's not even permitted to be in one. She's just recently divorced for like the sixth or seventh time. Like, it's not that she doesn't know. I've explained all of this. I've opened up my Bible. I've explained to her in Scripture. And over the phone, she acknowledges that what she has done is sinful and is adulterous. And over the phone, she's telling me that she's turned away from it. But she hasn't. And so, in this is the pastor's burden, in a sense. I mean, there's, there's so many different uh, categories that this addresses, right? Sexual immorality in the church, sexual immorality in your family, uh, and in this sense, the pastor's burden. Because I have explained this in detail, there is no excuse for ignorance. She knows this. 
and yet she is continuing going from one marriage to another marriage, um, being unfaithful in these marriages. It breaks my heart because this is my mother. But then I cannot, from the pulpit, condemn sexual immorality in this church and in the, the, the families and lives of our congregation. Including and, the local congregation and our online audience. Right, and then excuse it in my own family. I, I, I can't, I can't do it. And so I keep her in my prayers, I do. I pray for her often. But she, I, I can't have, I, I can't have that kind of uh, connection or communication with her. And I know that there are some that'll say, oh, but this is your mother and you need to forgive her. It's not my forgiveness that she needs. She needs to repent and turn away from this sin. When you, when you have someone who gets married and cheats, divorced, married, cheats, divorced, married, cheats, divorced over half a dozen times. Uh, you know, and I understand she's, she's nearing her 70s now. Um, this might be the, her last round of it, but still, absent true repentance and turning from it, I fear for her. So we have that pa pa uh, pastor's burden even in our own family. Uh, and this is something that many Christian parents have with their children. Yeah. When their children first um, uh, come to adulthood and go out on their own and they start living crazy, right? Now, it may not be in the same way um, or require the same type of response, but you know, you know your child knows what's right and wrong and they're doing wrong and you tell them and they're not listening, right? So in a sense, that, that, that I guess that's how our, our audience can, yeah, can relate. Uh, I think most of the people in the audience have dealt with toxic relationships where sometimes you can reason and you come to an understanding. Other times you have to draw some fairly hard boundaries to prevent that toxicity from spilling over. Uh, in your case, you have a situation, even by some of the more liberal standards of what the Bible means, marriage was turned into a license for adultery. When you uh, marry, divorce, marry, divorce, just over and over in rapid succession, then it's just a cover for sexual immorality. It's not being done in the sense of holy matrimony till death do us part. Um, uh, becoming one flesh with this person. It's just uh, a way of getting in and out of a relationship. And, you know, the case could be made that if you're going to do it that way, you might as well just go out and just openly do the immorality. You're not less guilty by putting a marriage certificate on top of that. Uh, How this is most commonly manifested, talking about the pastor's burden, is where you have a pastor, oftentimes of say a small church, small town church maybe, and the church isn't growing. Um, they're not, it, it seems like they're, they're unable to reach the community, even though they're reaching out, right? Uh, the church isn't growing, but also they're addressing issues in the community and issues in the congregation that just, it seems to be having no impact. And it, at some point, at some point, a pastor who's experiencing this is going to come to the conclusion of, I'm wasting my time. If I'm not able to bring new people into the house of God, and the congregation that, I, that I'm pastoring, um, if I'm not making a difference, and they're not changing, they're not, they're not seeking to be perfected in Christ. They're not trying to abide in him. They're not, you know, whatever, whatever it is that, that the pastor is addressing and it, you know, they get, especially if it's, oh, amen, that was an amazing sermon pastor, but then nothing changes. Eventually you're like, why, 
anybody could be given a sermon. It doesn't matter because they're not listening to me. Uh, the statistics on pastor burnout are alarming. alarming. Like the vast majority, well over 60% have right. considered quitting at least once in the past five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think something like less than 30% of young pastors finish their working years as a pastor. It's I, I would say that if you consider not not necessarily quitting the ministry altogether, but quitting their post as pastor of a specific church. Yeah. It's even higher where you have many pastors that are just like, you know what? I'm not making a difference here. I'm going to go somewhere where I can make a difference. Sadly, when you're a pastor, here's the thing, and we're going to see this in scripture here later. When you're experiencing that pastor's burden, it's because you're on the right track. Yes. It's because you're on the right track and that uh, you need to see it through because there is going to be a breakthrough. Yes. And there's two principles that we're going to uncover when we go to the uh, scriptures of some very well-known saints of God who experience the same thing. One of them is, is that it helps us to focus on the micro in terms of what has God called you to do. Don't burn out because the overall task is simply too great. God doesn't send us to tend the whole field, but to a specific section of the field, and that's what we're to do. For some, it might be a single row. Others might have one field out of a whole bunch of fields. Uh, yeah. And then the second principle will be is that we can't evaluate our success by in terms of the present problems, but we have to see the long-term trajectory of what God's doing. Right. A perfect example of looking at the micro. So paying attention to the micro rather than the macro is it, it, when I be, by micro, I mean the individual, right? Uh, that is the anecdote to the pastor's burden. When you begin seeing individual lives changed, maybe your church isn't growing. Maybe it's not. Um, I remember it actually wasn't all that long ago. And I had, was preaching a sermon, and there was a young man in our in the front row. I think it was, in fact, I think it was the very front row. Mm -hmm. And this young man rarely pays much attention during sermons. Rarely pays much attention at all. He's typically his his gaze is off somewhere. But in this sermon, his eyes were glued to me. And I could tell that this sermon was touching his heart in a particular way. And that this was a message that he needed to hear. And I do believe it has made a difference. I, I began seeing a difference in this young man. Um, still a young man. And as young men, we all make uh, poor decisions. We can all be knuckleheads. This is true, uh, but I did begin to see a difference. It was making a difference in him. And so that's uplifting. When you preach a sermon and it, you can see that it makes a positive difference in someone's life, praise God. That's, that, that can be just the little encouragement that you need. And in the New Testament, you know, people think of things like all of Paul's great missionary, missionary journeys, but the bulk of the evangelizing in the New Testament was not done by the apostles. It was done by individual Christians who they, they might live three years as a Christian before getting martyred, but they've led two or three to the Lord before they pass on. And through that reproductive cycle, the church grew. And of course, the, I'm not discounting the leadership of the apostles. They, they were essential sure. to provide leadership in the church, but they didn't do all of the lifting. They didn't do all and, of the no. And I, I think for me, uh, one part of the pastor's burden is related to the fact that we promote the fivefold ministry. And for me, 
the one of the most difficult things is that when you have people come in and they're not open to being taught because that's in order for the fivefold to prosper you have to have people who can be taught who can be trained to step up to uh, fulfill their gift whether it's a gift of service or encouragement or exhortation or intercession or whether you you have that young man coming in who God's called to eventually sit in the seat of an elder or uh, an evangelist evangelist or prophet or apostle and uh, when you have people coming in that you that after a few rounds with them you know you're not going to be able to teach them anything for whatever right. reason uh, some of them may think they know more than you so they're not going to hear anything right. others uh, are what I call church rabbits. They go from place to place. They, their theology is just cobbled together bits and pieces from these disparate sources. And sometimes it will even be contradictory ideas that's just been kind of thrown into uh, a cerebral, a cerebral bend rather than a, a well thought out faith. Some of the burnout that we can have and a, a, a a good friend and mentor to both of us, uh, Pastor Bill Hudson, had experienced uh, his own burnout. And it's it's not necessarily the pastor's burden so much as just being overwhelmed, yeah. right? As a leader, if you try to do everything, right? Because there, there's so, yes. many, so many things that need to be done administratively in the church if you're trying to do it all. Um or you're micromanaging to the point where you might as well be doing it all, you can get burnout that way too, but that's that's a different kind of burnout. Than it is, it's burnout. one that is not a particular vulnerability in how we do church because we sure. have an elder, an elder ran church is right. less likely to have that. Yeah. A conventional senior pastor driven church is more likely, and especially one that does not practice the fivefold, where ministry is seen as something that's done by the elites. Then you get the guy at the top who's responsible for everything, and he's either doing everything, or if he's not doing everything, if something goes wrong anywhere, the buck stops with that yeah, the individual. The benefit of, of having a plurality of elder model. Is just that is, you know, one single individual. They're not preaching every week, um, and all of the uh, leadership duties, the ministerial leadership duties, can be split amongst the plur you know the, that plurality of elders, rather than you know a single pastor having to carry all that burden. And it's not that a single pastor can't. It's just that it's easier when it's spread out. You can have a distribution of labor. Distribution of labor, right. So the pastor's burden. I personally believe every pastor at some point is going to experience this. Some more than others. Yes. Some might even experience, uh, uh, to various degrees, the pastor's burden the whole time they're in the ministry. Yes. The one qualifier is, now if you have a faithless pastor, they may not. If you've got someone who's just building a platform and they're raking in the money and uh, their own personal life and the inner uh, organizational life of their organization has no relation to Christ and they're just there to make a buck or uh, become famous, they may not feel that burden because their uh, crosshairs are not pointed towards building up the church of God, building up Christ. It's building up their own personal platform. So their only burden if something happens that interferes with, with their platform. Yeah, the key word there is a faithful pastor. If you have a faithless pastor, if you've got a, one who's in the ministry uh, because they're greedy for filthy lucre, to use a biblical language, uh, they're in it for the money, uh, or they're narcissistic and they're in it for the uh, attention and, and possible admiration of others, right? Uh, yeah, that they're they're unlikely to experience the pastor's burden. They might experience other burdens, but not necessarily. They the they become burdened when they're found out. When they're found out, that's right. when they become burdened. When they're found out, when they the the big lie has been exposed and the ministry's crashing down. 
And I remember when the Jimmy Swagger scandal was a big deal, when the Jimmy Baker scandal was a big deal. But now we seem to have a scandal a week that's uh, as big or bigger than, than those two. That's now just business as usual. Sometimes I'm not all that surprised when there's a pastor scandal because of who the pastor was, yeah. right? Right now, there's a big scandal with T.D. Uh, Jakes. A big scandal with T.D. Jakes. I mentioned two things in the news. One of them was, of course, James River Church uh, men's uh, retreat had one, but then there were is a group of prophets that are now selling prophecy, uh, selling training to be a prophet, including one guy who uh, became very well known for missing the broad side of the bar in the election cycle, said he would never be a prophet again. Well, now uh, for four or $500 a session, he'll teach you how to be a prophet. Uh, uh, Jeremiah Johnson, he, he had a scandal because he failed, uh, along with a whole bunch of other NAR prophets who failed to accurately predict had, the election. I hadn't heard of this one. So you can't learn to be a prophet. I, I'm immediately reminded in the book of Acts uh, where you had individuals who wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? You can't. There's no amount of money that you could pay, no amount of classes you could take to be a prophet. That was Simon Magus who offered to buy, right. and by through some accountings, he was the first Gnostic. Through some accountings. Right. Uh, definitely, he, uh, the information we have suggests he was definitely into Gnosticism. And of course, these ministries that are selling also have Gnostic roots in a lot of what they do rather than biblical roots. So you, you have Jeremiah Johnson and some other well-known prophets now charging people to, to be tutored into being a prophet. You, you have, uh, some say he wasn't actually trying to do a strip tease, but it, he was definitely a stripper. He was definitely working a pole. Uh, and what, what, what certainly appeared to be an Asherah pole, uh, Pastor Driscoll, Mark, Mark Driscoll, Driscoll. Uh, called he it called it out perfectly. He did what needed to be done. His rebuke, I, I think, is the most loving rebuke I've ever heard. Now, he, wasn't, he was interrupted. He was not allowed to finish it. Um, and he was rebuking the activity. He didn't focus on any one ind individual. But he was absolutely right. Um, I've seen... Uh, the video of the event that he's talking about and the fact that that was taking place at a men's event. This was an openly homosexual uh, stripper and um, kind of like, like a circus performer uh, performing at a Christian men's conference. Not only, it's not just yeah. inappropriate. It, so the host pastor uh, was quoting, you know, Matthew 18, right? He's calling on Matthew 18 and misapplying it. <clears throat> this was not a private sin. Matthew 18, and that's addressing a private sin. This was not a private sin. This was a public error and a public sin that needed to be called out. There's no, this has no business whatsoever being associated with any church, any conference, any Christian whatsoever. Yes, I, I want, I'd like to unpack Matthew 18 for some that might not be familiar with the reference. That's where Jesus said, if somebody sins against you, uh, you go talk to them. If right. you can reconcile, you're good. Uh, if not, then you bring two or three witnesses so that every fact is established. And then if he still refuses to repent, you then bring it before the church. Right. And if he refuses to listen to the church, then he's to be treated as a heathen. Matthew 18 was meant to address personal uh, private sense, private conflict, and it was a method of due process right. whereby any individual in the church could involve the church 
in matters of justice and matters of righteousness. Matthew 18 was not set up for those who already had authority as leaders. If, if you are in a position of leadership in the church, you don't have to wait to address public sin privately. If we see somebody coming in and they're doing the striptease act in the congregation, I'm not going to wait to for Matthew 18. There's going to be an immediate response. And in terms of what happened there, if I was in a position of leadership to which uh, John Lindell was accountable, we would be having a disciplinary conversation. I'm sure. not going to say necessarily without such a conversation what would happen, but there would be a disciplinary that hearing right. that, that would be going on asking why, how did this, how did this happen? Why did you allow this to take place? And then depending on his answers, I would then move forward from there in terms of what I would do or advocate. So the T.D. Jakes scandal is much bigger and much worse and is getting far less attention. And it is, it has come out that um, rapper and producer Sean Combs, P. Diddy, whatever name he's going by, yeah. this whole, I mean, he's, he's on the run. As far as I know, he hasn't been, he hasn't been arrested yet, but you know, it's the federal government is after him for uh, human trafficking, um, you know, human sex trafficking, um, and his associations with many other celebrities, right, in these homosexual parties and trafficking of young boys. This is homosexual yes, sex trafficking. celebrities what Epstein was to political. Right. And so T.D. Jakes was one that regularly participated in these same-sex um, drug parties uh, where there would be um, sexual acts performed and then Sean Combs would have that filmed and then he now owns those people right well T.D. Jakes participated in many of those not just once right there's a, a story of where Denzel Washington was invited to one of those parties and he promptly left once he saw he did what I would have done at the James River once the guy started working the pole I would have been, it been out and so Denzel Washington God bless him he's a man of God um, I I've loved his acting since I first saw him I think the movie was called uh, carbon copy back in the 1980s he was a young man early 80s um, but he's been one of my favorite actors for a very long time and to know that he's also he's not just a Christian like he's a strong man of God and he allows the Holy Spirit to guide him, right? Uh, I'm so glad that uh, he had the discernment to get out of there as soon as he figured out, well, this ain't right. But now T.D. Jakes, who's a, for those who don't know, I know you know, everybody knows, but just in case, yeah. he's... He's one of those prosperity, uh, name it and claim it, uh, pastors. Yes, a pastor of the Potter's House Ministry in Texas. And it's not it's a mega church campus, but he's also uh, got an online ministry broadcast on TV, radio. Very big, very well known. Very well known, right. Um, and he, he's been preaching heresy for decades. But this, yeah, this so much This worse. is criminal. This is criminal, right? When you're talking about the trafficking of young boys, um, the literal enslavement of even grown men, um, and the use of uh, those acts, to the filming of those acts uh, to manipulate and control other people, and that T.D. Jakes is right at the center of this as a professed not just Christian, but as a pastor. So that he's in the same position as Rabbi Zacharias, not somebody. Worse. Uh, yeah. Worse. It's, yeah. it's worse. Uh, not somebody, he can't say, oh, I, this is a mistake or I have a weakness. He has aligned himself with predators and sexual predation. 
And what needs to happen is that he, one, needs to be treated as a predator. Uh, he needs to be removed from his church if possible. Those who go there need to exit, and then the appropriate authorities need to investigate him. Right. That's He Absolutely. needs to be in jail. Absolutely. I, I imagine what's going to happen is Sean Combs will be the only one yeah. that gets prosecuted. He's got enough money. He'll just do that to the money. and he'll, Well... Uh, this is a whole big conversation and a conversation for another day. I'm just saying, just like we have seen in similar type cases, he'll be the only one prosecuted. Yeah. If they even get a hold of Yes. Him. That is a conversation for another day, but the intersect between T.G. Jakes and now is part of the pastor's burden is the growing apostasy at the highest levels of leadership right. in the church in America. Things like that are increasingly becoming uh, no longer a major scandal, just another day at the office. Yeah, so we can allow ourselves to be overcome with stories like what happened with Mark Driscoll or or uh, the actions of T.D. Jakes or... And the IHOP KC scandal that hasn't fully cooled down yet, it's still... Right, or, or the proliferation of false doctrines and outright heresies. Um, um, modern day Arianism, uh, modern day uh, antinomianism. Um, Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, right? Um, that the, the modern American Nicolaitans, that is our woke, our far left woke churches. Um, they are the Nicolaitans. That's who they are. Uh, and if, for those who want to know more, we have a broadcast. Uh, I think it was two or three months ago about uh, the Nicolaitans. It might have been that long ago. I we, forget the exact well, date, but we did a whole discussion on the was, Nicolaitans. I think it was at the beginning of the year, at least. Yep. Anyway, we, we have a video called The Nicolaitans, where we discuss in depth. In in depth. The, right. So, pastor's burden in the macro, uh, we're, we are all sensitive to this, right? Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned in the macro and what's going on nationally or what's going on globally or, or what's going on just in the American church as a whole, mm -hmm. right? We need to be concerned. But if we allow that focus to become larger than what our focus is on our individual congregation, we are going to become overwhelmed. We yeah. are going to get burned out. That is going to happen. So we need to have a, our primary focus on our own yeah. congregation and from there to focus individually and not just as a whole. Well, you know, I'm thinking of this in military terms, and you could probably flesh this out better than I can, given your experience. But if a military is going to war against an enemy, you might have the generals who are worried about the macro and it's good that they're there to worry about the macro. There needs to be a plan for that. But uh, ultimately, warfare isn't one in the macro. It's in the micro with individual. Uh, of course, you're coordinating with other individuals and other micros. But if you're that company commander or you're that sergeant, uh, you might be aware of the big theater, but you're going to think more about how I'm going to take this hill or how I'm going to conquer well, this a town. Lot, a lot of it is, is on a need to know. So like your individual squad or platoon or maybe even your individual company, commander, doesn't need to know everything. All they need to know is what their individual specific area is, what, what they are specifically doing. You know, a company commander doesn't need to have the same knowledge base as a battalion commander or a brigade commander, right? Um, and it's not necessarily less, just a different knowledge base. The individual commander... No, it is less. Yeah. It is less. So the higher up that chain you go, the bigger of a picture that yeah. you get. So when you go all the way down to the fire team leader, that's who I was, right? Fire team leader, Sergeant E5. All I need to know is what I, me and my team are doing within the framework of our squad and platoon. I don't need to know, so and I won't, and I wouldn't know what's going on in the broader sense. Yeah. 
Uh, or so maybe we, even I may not even know why I why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. So you need to know enough if your mission is to conquer the city and secure it, then your mission would need to know only what's necessary to conquer that city to secure it. Uh, and to that end, you might have scouts to give you intelligence, or you might receive it from up the chain if right. uh, they have that knowledge. They well, would. I mean, if you're a squad leader or even a, a platoon leader, um, all you need to know is what is what your element, specific element, is doing. You don't need to know the entire battle plan. In fact, it's it's best that you don't know the entire battle plan. That. Is that in case you get captured, they can't well, interrogate it out of you? That can if be you part don't know of what it. it is. That can be part of it, but you're you're wasting time if you're explaining all the details of the wider plan to people who only have a small sliver. When all they need to do is do their sliver, you need to, you need them to do the sliver. You need them to know the sliver, the ins and outs of precisely what they are expected to do. They don't need to know what everybody's doing just how to take that city and to communicate with the others in their company right. so that they don't end up killing each other. Right. So, I mean, there's, there is still the, um, the, the, it's governed over by a commander mm -hmm. who does know all the slivers, right? Does know everyone's job. He does see the big picture. He's the only one that needs to know the big picture. Yeah. So we take that, apply it, which kind of equates, you know, as we're pastors, we just need to worry about our church yeah. more so than anything else. Just worry about our church. Worry about our church and in the community we've been called to reach out to. So in, in our case, that could be right. involve our congregation as one circle. The next circle would be Charlestown. And then maybe a third circle, which is not quite concentric, might be Clark County. the Clark County. I'm also thinking now with the internet, we have an online audience, sure. an online dimension, sure. uh, and a specific group that's within in that. Uh, you but know. if we start worrying about what's going on in the Southern Baptist Convention, or what's going on in uh, Springfield, Missouri, or um, you know, things that are outside of our sphere, literally outside of our sphere of influence, and we're allowing that to overwhelm us, we're focusing on the wrong thing. Would that be like a commander who's slow in battle because he's daydreaming or worrying about some, and he's not focused on the the battle plan yeah I, I suppose I suppose yeah um, so now we're gonna go into some scripture uh, we have Jeremiah's burden here and uh, we don't I don't think we need to read all of it but what we see here is Jeremiah's burden he, um, yeah. he was in prison in the first few verses he was in prison he was literally in a prison that was in the house of God. So the, 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 the temple had its own police force. Mm -hmm. Like if you violate temple rules, if you use a Gentile in the wrong area, you might get, or if you use a Jew in an area reserved for the priests, one of the things they could do is that they could lock you up in this area. And so Jeremiah was locked up in this area. Probably he was prophesying in the temple. And sure. so as such, he they came under the jurisdiction of the temple police. And this pastor uh, ordered him locked up. So he's locked up. He's uh, beaten while under custody in verse 2. And so we're, you know, and then in verse 3, he's bringing them out of the stocks. And, of course, Jeremiah starts prophesying to him. The Lord has not called thy name pastor, uh, but Magormasibib. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And then... Uh, mm -hmm. For thus saith the Lord, I will make thee a terror to myself. And so he's prophesying doom and gloom to this priest. Uh, and he says, your Judah's going to be carried away to Babylon. Uh, yeah. On that slide there, then we go to uh, verses 5. Uh, again, he's continued to prophesy against Judah. It says, I'll deliver all the strength of the city, the laborers, the precious things. He's going to give it to their hand to the enemies. They're going to be carried off to Babylon. And then in right. verse 6. Yeah, so he's, he's prophesying of the destruction 
yeah. that is to come be, due to the disobedience yes. of the and, people. Yes, and in verse 6, a specific sentence for Pashur as one who was protecting the wicked, refusing to listen to the word of the Lord. He says, "You all, everyone in your house is going to go into captivity. That shall come to Babylon, and there you're going to die. And so then, you know, uh, in verse uh, 7 through 9 here, this is where Jeremiah is now feeling the burden. He spoke these strong words, and now after he's given the prophecy, he's starting to feel the burden uh, of not only nobody listening to him, but he's persecuted. Persecuted and alone. If Jerem and if Jeremiah were to have judged his ministry just on his current problem, he'd say, Lord, I'm just wasting my time. And he basically... He basically says that. Says that. Says that. Uh, but we're going to see here that that's the wrong way to look at Jeremiah. He ended up being one of the greatest prophets of God because of the long game God was playing and using him. But this is what he says here. Uh, he said, so after he, he, he identifies like all of these things that he's yeah. done, for, for since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, right? Uh, and then he says, it, uh, of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. So he's suffering daily for this. He said, verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. So basically, he quit the ministry. He says, I'm going to quit. Yeah. But it didn't uh, it didn't uh, end that way because the, the anointing was so strong on him, he could not speak. He was compelled to speak the words of the Lord, and of course, he continued to do that. And then we go to the first uh, 10 here uh, through 11. Uh, I heard that the fame of many fear on every side. Reports say they, and we were reported. All my familiars watched my halting, saying, Perhaps he will be enticed and will prevail against him and we shall take our revenge on him so he had all these people folks lying in wait for him to mess up so they could pounce on him discredit him uh this was cancel culture mm -hmm. this is cancel culture and back then cancel culture was deadly was deadly not not figuratively damage to your platform but you might literally lose your head well, uh yeah. and uh, or, or get your skull smashed in from all the rocks uh, but the Lord was with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble. They shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. Most of his persecutors, we don't even know their names, but we know Jeremiah's name. So what we see in this story of Jeremiah is that he's ready to quit. And, and, and some might say that at least for a time he did. Um, but he did he did persist yes um, and in the end his prophecy of uh, uh, Judah being delivered unto Babylon right being conquered like it happened it happened to the letter not just the ballpark not just like uh, we have a lot of prophecies that are they're in the ballpark but they're not entirely accurate his was accurate to the letter he said 70 years and it was 70 years exactly it was seven years exactly So Jeremiah, and we're going to go to Elijah's bird in a minute, but in the last part of this, he's basically verses 14 through 18 saying, I wish I was never born. Right. Well, that's something that's commonly said in Scripture. Job talked about this, mm -hmm. about wishing he had never been born. Many of us have said that yeah. at, at times. When we've been alone, right, in our left to our own thoughts, and maybe we were wallowing in our own sorrow and pity, and wishing that we had never been born. You had talked about suicidal ideations. Would that be considered a class of that, or a subset sure. of that? Sure. Now, there's there's two kinds of suicidal ideations. There's active and passive, right? 
and of course active suicidal ideations is someone wants they don't it's not that just that they want to die they want to take their own life and they're formulating a plan right mm -hmm. a passive suicidal ideation is just desiring to die or disappear um, without making any plans of taking their own life it might manifest more of you know it'd be great if like I don't know my car would slide off the road into a tree or if I'd go to sleep and just not wake up yeah and because these men were they had both a, a knowledge of the Word of God and the anointing they both knew better than to take their life. So they weren't gambling right. to take their life, but they were at a point where, you know, the, the, the pathway they would use would be to say, God, kill me. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're wishing that they would either die uh, by God's hand or wishing that they just simply had not ever been born. Well, as pastors, we can, maybe not, we can at times regret entering the ministry there's there's times where pastors have done have got to that point and it's like you know I've, I've spent all this time on education or all this time in ministry and I've been behind the pulpit for you know a set number of years and I I feel like I've wasted my life right or the or all I've ever done is suffer for the sake of the ministry with no uh, tangible gain uh, for God or, or maybe even individually. Two things about Jeremiah here before we move on to uh, I, or not Isaiah but Elijah. If, if you evaluate Jeremiah's condition by his platform at that moment, if you just take a snapshot uh, or if you evaluate it by how he felt then his ministry was a waste. It's the value of it comes into focus only when you look at it from a wide lens to see what happened. Jeremiah uh, ended up being one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, and he's well known even to today. Uh, we know nothing about most of his detractors and the few whose names are mentioned are known only because they're mentioned in Jeremiah's book. Uh, and whatever Jeremiah included about them in the book, what the Lord had him include about them in the book. Uh, and they became a byword, which is what the prediction was here. They would become a byword. And Jeremiah prevailed. We know him to be the greatest prophet. So, folks, those of you who may be in a ministry, who may be feeling that now, and discouraged and think about quitting the ministry, don't judge your ministry based on the snapshot of what's happening today, but think in the wider lens of what God is wanting to do through your through your whole life and and, and your whole ministry, not just oh things are bad, uh, the elders are against me, my congregation doesn't like me, or whatever is burdening you, whatever might be troubling you. Uh, sometimes a burden is general, other times a burden is driven because specific individuals have arisen to make themselves your enemy. Right. Right. That happens as well. So as we go now, uh, Elijah's burden, I, I think we, we covered that last slide on Jeremiah. Yes, we, we, we covered it. Uh, and it will be in the PowerPoint on the church website for people who want to look at all the scriptures. But Elijah's burden started coming into focus. Because of Jezebel. Uh, yes. Jezebel. Uh, right after his greatest victory. Sometimes you can be on cloud nine one day and the next day at the bottom of the pit uh, thinking all is lost. And so Elijah's coming off of this high from this victory here. Uh, and of course Ahab is talking. He, he tells his wife Jezebel all the things Elijah's done and how he's slain all the prophets with the sword. Uh, and of course uh, the, that story is in, in, in chapter 18. I call it the Elijah principle. Elijah purposefully stacked the deck against himself at God's command so that God's power is displayed. He's outnumbered 850 to 1. He drowns his sacrifice 
the fire of the Lord comes and everybody knows that the God of Elijah is the God of Israel and that uh, the God Ahab and Jezebel were worshiping were false gods. So Elijah wins. Uh, the false prophets are put to death and Ahab is hanging his head down telling Jezebel what Elijah did and how he slew the prophets with the sword. And in verse 2, we pick up with what Jezebel does. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, uh, and left yeah. his servant there. So what Je Jezebel is essentially, she's threatening the life. Yes, she's Elijah. threatening to kill him. She's threatening to kill Elijah for what he's done. Um, and we see that Elijah then he flees. He went uh, a day's journey into the wilderness. Um, and then he, at a juniper tree, he just kind of collapses. He just kind of gives in at this point. It's like he just lays down and gives up. Um, it says uh, for himself that he might die. Um, but it, that, wasn't, that wasn't enough. So while Elijah, in that moment of weakness, had just laid down to give up to die, God did not give up. Yeah. And he sent an angel. This might be the only prayer that Elijah prayed that did not get answered. Elijah was known for the giving powerful answers to his prayers. Elijah shut up the waters uh, to Israel during the month of his prophecy as a judgment on its wickedness. And then he prayed again to open them up so that rain would come. Uh, Elijah uh, raised people from the dead. So when he prayed, there were big answers are coming. But this time, God didn't say yes. So an angel comes and cares for him, feeds him. He's able to sleep and rest and eat and be rejuvenated. Um, and then he goes on a journey. Um, and it says here, and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. And here um, he... Uh, He's given some directions by God. Yes. On what he's going to be doing. Yeah, there, there's a twofold as we go from verse 9 to verse 18. First, the Lord reveals himself in, in a very unusual way because Elijah is thinking, we're going back to the pastor's burden. His burden wasn't that he wasn't doing anything, but that the task was simply too big to be done. Right. And so he says, God, I'm not any better than my father's. This is too big for me. And so the Lord reveals himself. Uh, he sends fire and storm and all these big things that most of us charismatic Christians would say God's in that. But we're told that God wasn't in that. He was in the still small voice. Right. That, this is really amazing. So there's the mighty wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, um, and then after the earthquake, uh, a fire. Um, and it says, but the Lord was not in the fire. Um, that last little bit as we read, and after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. So the mouth of this cave. Yes, he was in the mouth of the cave. Uh, God's revelation was, I am in the small things. It doesn't matter this is too big for you because I'll be wherever the actions needed. Right. And so God was in a still small voice, which is like a whisper. And I know that the camera didn't pick up that whisper, but it was like that. It's like a... Uh, uh, yeah, so the still small voice is how God often does speak to us. Yeah. And so we can look at the big things and become overwhelmed. But when we begin to focus on the little things yeah. in our life, that is where we begin to see the hand of God. That is where we begin yeah. to see the yeah. face of God. 
And that is where we, we can find our encouragement. And that was God saying, uh, don't worry if this is too big for you because uh, I'm going to be present in a small enough way to be with you in the part of the burden that you have been tasked to carry. And so then in our next frame here, we're going to see that God uh, not only has a, a burden for Elijah, but he's going to use Elijah to prepare the framework for something that was going to be bigger, that was going to continue on after he leaves the scene. And so in verse 15, the Lord said unto him, Go, return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Yehu to be the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. So he's anointing two kings here. Now the third one is not a king, uh, but it's going to be his successor, Elisha. Elisha to be prophet in thy room. And then God gives a promise to Elijah here. And it shall come to pass that him that escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Yehu should Elijah slay. And then at the end of it, he says, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed the bell, and every mouth which have not kissed them. In other words, he's telling Elijah, you are not alone. You're not as alone as you think you are because I have others like you who are faithful. Right. So while you may feel that it is that you are alone in your burden, you are not. God is there with you and there are others that are called to ministry maybe even within your own church yeah. right in your community but maybe even within your own church that can help carry that burden and no matter what is going on no matter what the opposition you are facing particularly in times of great struggle and apostasy God is always bigger Yes, there, there are other ministries. Uh, and, of course, now will be the time for our, our last slide. Uh, and this is the message of the hour. This is what the faithful remnant's going to preach. And I, I am convinced that uh, repentance is the message of the hour. Every sermon should touch on either repentance or judgment or the cross and that uh, we should spend probably at least 20% of our messages where that one of those three is a fundamental focus. If we're not doing that, we're not really engaged in where the battle is. The big issue of the time is that uh, there's a widespread need of the church in America to repent. A really good sermon to preach would be out of Titus. Um, and I've preached this sermon before. Uh, I'm sure I'll preach it many times mm -hmm. before or uh, 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 later um, in the ministry. We as pastors need to, yes, proclaim Christ and him crucified, but also to teach sound doctrine. Yeah. Right? Um, to, we need to condemn false doctrines and then have our lives to be uh, a living testimony. Yes. Right? Through our, our, our good conduct. We, if we neglect any aspect of that, then you start seeing imbalances, right? Well, right now, as we're coming unto the Lord's judgment, as it is just around the corner, we need to be proclaiming Christ and him crucified, repent or perish. We need to be preaching uh, and proclaiming good, sound doctrine in face of all of the... Uh, false doctrines that are uh, prevalent today. And, but we need to be doing all of this through good, righteous living. Let's, let's go yes. back to Mark Driscoll in that he rightly was condemning some ungodly behavior and, and performance, truly ungodly performance, at a Christian men's conference and he did so with such love and grace yes 
He absolutely did the right thing, the thing that needed to be done. The bigger question is why Pastor John Lindell didn't immediately confront this. Uh, and of course, the very first question is, uh, was this guy vetted before they brought him in? Uh, and uh, if that failed, then uh, there was an obligation uh, for Pastor John Lindell to have immediately pulled the plug as soon as the guy started working a pole, taking his shirt off and, and working around a pole and doing this odd, obscene performance, whether uh, some are trying to say it wasn't actually a strip tease, but it, it was absolutely the appearance of evil, uh, absolutely something that did not belong in a church setting where you're talking of the things of God and encouraging men right. to be godly men. Did this, this had nothing to do with godliness and godliness required that it be stopped, but he, he, he failed to evaluate at it. He failed to stop it when it happened, and then when God moved upon someone to rebuke it, instead of rebuking the abomination, he rebuked the messenger. Right. And while there's reports they later reconciled, uh, the reconciliation was all, uh, was very late in the game, and the question as to how that was allowed to unfold needs to be answered. Right, right. Mark, yeah, Mark Driscoll was absolutely right. Uh, in, in addressing uh, the, that performance. And he was absolutely correct in the way that he did so, was my point. And we need to remember that. Uh, that is a great example. I, I'm not saying I agree with everything that Mark Driscoll's ever said or preached, but in this, yeah. that is a, a, a great example of how we as men of God should be addressing issues within the church when, whenever we see those those types of issues when we interact with the world it needs to be done with love with a loving kindness with long suffering um, it, it can be easy for us to fall into either one camp of anger or one camp of despair Right, because that's another yeah. avenue that someone may go into more of a militant type response, right? To respond with anger. So, something I said to you recently when it comes to not just false doctrines, but talking about heresies in the church, right? There was a time where I would, I would uh, read of this story of this, this church becoming heretical and I'd get angry. I no longer get angry. I become immediate, I just sorrowful. Yeah. My heart becomes heady, heavy. My heart aches. And it breaks know, my heart. sadness is truly the appropriate response, you know, because whenever heresy becomes established somewhere, that increases the risk of people needlessly going to hell. Because uh, if people follow these damnable heresies, and then they appear before God and they think, well, I'm saved. And then they find out on judgment day that uh, depart from me. Uh, and they say, I believed on you. And then the Lord says, you didn't. By damnable heresies, we mean heresies that deny the very foundation of the faith. That being original sin, the exclusivity of Christ, um, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Um, the five solas um, that we are saved by um, grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone according to the scriptures alone to the glory of God alone doctrines that could cause us to fail to actually have our faith pointed at the real Christ and be instead pointed at some type of image that we've created in our mind Right. And so people say, I believe in you. Well, the Lord says, no, you didn't. You believed in this imaginary image of me that didn't represent me. Right. And the reason that their faith was pointed at the imaginary image was that they believed doctrines that prevented them from being able. If you get the nature of God wrong, then your faith isn't pointed at him. It's pointed at something else. Uh, also, uh, the hypostatic union and the a church that denies the hypostatic union, right? That, that denies that God is, or that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. 
they deny that, right? Like Bill Johnson of Bethel, yes. who denies that that Jesus was is is the preexistent God. Yes. He spent a good portion of uh, the seventh chapter of a, a book when heaven invades earth, and this came up in an online exchange and. A prominent local pastor denied there was any heresies and I brought up that he uh, spent the good part of a chapter in his book laying out his heretical views. Uh, he would later try to walk it back in a video when he got into a lot of trouble, but the video was just damage control. Sure. Uh, the, and my reply was the book, I believe, represented better what he really believed. Books aren't things that are, are written idly. They, I've written about eight books, and by the time you've put something out in book form, you've done a lot of thought into the words, how the words go together, how the paragraphs, the ordering of the chapters. There's a lot that goes into the writing of a book. So if you put Daniel Heresy in a book form, then he's he's thought a lot about this. It wasn't some uh, idle uh, misspeaking of words that, that uh, we're prone to do. So yeah, a, a measure of whether a church's teachings is just false doctrine versus heresy versus damnable heresy. Yeah. If it denies uh, the very foundations of our faith, it's a damnable heresy. If it denies that Jesus is God, it's a damnable heresy. If it denies that, yeah. that Christ's sacrifice on the cross is all sufficient, it's a heresy. Uh, if it denies the substitutionary atonement that his death on the cross is is the, the the payment for our sins if they deny the exclusivity of christ that it is yes. through christ alone and only christ that we may be saved if they deny that it's a damnable heresy and folks out there all these heresies that pastor chris is describing do what one of two things that make it impossible for someone to have faith in christ they either give people a false picture of who he is, and so when they, when the person who believes that says, I believe in Christ, they're not pointing their faith at the real person of Christ, but at a phantom, or it's somehow denying what Christ did so they can't put their faith in the shed blood because they don't understand what that is. What you typically see is they're either adding to Christ or they're, or they're taken away from yeah. Christ, or in some sense, both. And there's people who follow who don't understand that they're, they're, they don't have their faith in Christ. They believe they do. They, they'll say the words, but because of these heresies. Their faith is really in their church, or yeah. it's, in, or it's yeah. in a pastor or a cult leader, or it's, it's not in Christ. The heresies have deceived them about where they really are. Right. Right. And, you know, uh, that's a screaming burning eternity with fire every bit as, as blazing as the fire in the, the font here. Uh, every bit as much doom as the, the doom font. That right. So we need, yeah, we need to be diligent per, uh, and persevere. Um, when we feel overwhelmed, um, don't stop. Don't, don't give up. Don't lay down at the foot of that juniper and just give up to die. The stakes They're, are too high. Stakes are too high. There's more to be done. And you may feel that you're walking it alone, but you are not. You are not alone. We're in the company of, of some of the greatest men of faith in the entire Bible. They went through this. Elijah was arguably the most anointed man in the Old Testament. He, he, he went through this. Right. So, yeah, if, 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 if anyone watching this who's a pastor, who's in ministry, or, or maybe just as a parent, and you, you're feeling overwhelmed. Here's someone else that went through that we didn't talk about tonight. You're not alone. And the Bible doesn't give us the details, but we are told in Scripture that Jesus was a man of sorrows. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean to be a man of sorrows? It means he went through these very what? same things and, and cried out to God in the way that Jeremiah and Elijah did and got well, uh, comfort from the Lord. Well, yeah, we could go to the Garden of Gethsemane with Christ in the Gospels, right? Um, Lord, uh, Father, if this cup should pass from me, 
right? Jesus himself even had his, his own moment. He knew what had to be done, and that there could only be another way. And, and the horrors of the, of the Passion of the Christ that Mel Gibson did a masterful job producing, captures only a small fraction. There's an entire spiritual saga that was going on that was not captured, uh, couldn't be captured very well. There's some theatrical licenses he did and how demons were pictured to try to do it. But some of the spiritual realities that were going on, there was no real good way to capture that in the medium of theater, but they was very real trials, very real reasons to be depressed at the prospect of going to the cross. You know, one thing that the Catholic Church, I think, does right, one of the things that they do right, is in observance of the stages of the cross. That's the passion of Christ. I think it's, it's too easy for us to just kind of gloss over what Christ truly did for us. Yeah. Like, what did Christ actually endure? Well, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, it does an amazing job yes. of showing that. Yeah, it was well informed. By the way, Mel Gibson is what they call a seat of vacantist Catholic. Okay. Which basically, it holds to the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, but, and there's differing groups within that, but the common uh, thread of all seat of vacantists is that they believe that the current pope is an apostate pope and not a legitimate occupant of the office. They believe that the papacy has been vacated. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a I'm lot not a of Catholic, Catholics yeah. that believe that. I'm not a Catholic. I don't think I'll ever be, but if I were to become one, I would be a seat of vacantist because there were dozens of places throughout church history where you could make the argument this was not a legitimate pope. Uh, that will be a conversation for another time if we ever have that conversation. That is, what's commonly said among Catholics in regards to the pope is that there's some popes that you follow and there's some that you endure. And a lot of them are using the word endurance to the current occupant. You just, yeah, you just endure. He's not a popular one. You endure until that pope yeah. is Now, Pope replaced. John Paul II, on the other hand, he was not only wildly popular among Catholics, he was popular with people who were not Catholics, very right. highly respected by a whole lot of people. And he and Ronald Reagan joined forces to end uh, communism. Um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth made it his mission to um, bring to an end the sex abuse scandals that were plaguing the Catholic Church at the time. And for his efforts, and this is a whole big long story. I actually had done some, a lot of research on this back. Might have been twenty eighteen. Um, it all, it be, the movement to force Pope Benedict's resignation so that they could install their communist pope um, began with taking control, talking about the, 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 the cardinals, mm -hmm. right? To take control of the uh, Vatican Bank and, to use, and they used it as leverage to force his resignation. And that's exactly what they did. The money trail, the purse strings is a poem. Right. Um, That's very Mystery Babylonish. That's how Mystery Babylon controls the world. Just uh, well, yanks see, the purse strings, and that's how she gets mm -hmm. the kings of the earth to commit adultery, and, and that's how uh, the masses get drunk. And of course, if you have to persecute people, you've got to pay the persecutors. Right. So, of course, we do not affirm uh, any uh, legitimacy or authority to the papacy, right? We're not Catholic. We're, yeah. we're a Protestant church that's um, that, that more of a rigid church hierarchy I do not at all believe is biblical. However, that isn't to say that there hasn't been a holy and righteous people in the history yeah. of the Catholic church that are most assuredly has been. 
um, whether they were a pope or whether they were uh, a Catholic farmer in, uh, you know, southern Belgium, you know. Any last comments before we close in terms of our discussion and, and where it's leading and well, in terms of how we would want to leave that discussion? If you're feeling overwhelmed, whether as a parent, you're feeling overwhelmed by the behavior of your teenaged uh, child or your young adult child that's going wayward, or whether you're in some capacity in the ministry and, and you feel that uh, you're, tr you're just treading water, you're, you're not getting anywhere, um, or you're feeling overwhelmed by what's happening in the culture and the church as a whole, or what's even going on politically. Stop, take a breath, try to focus on the micro and not the macro. And you can take some strength in knowing that you're not alone, Christ is with you. And while all you can see is what has happened up to this very point, God sees the big picture. God will see you through, and there is a breakthrough coming. Yes. Uh, there is a breakthrough coming. This is why we want to see the bigger picture of what God's doing, not just uh, the pressure cooker that you might now be in, but what, what God's going to do. And of course, uh, there's too much at stake for us not to proclaim the message of repentance, not to disciple people in the right ways of the Lord. There's just too much at stake. Well, God bless you. Thank you guys for uh, staying with us. If you're still watching us, staying with us this long. Uh, keep us in your prayers. We will... Uh, keep you in our prayers if you have any uh, prayer requests you can leave them in the comment section below um, God bless each and every one of you Heavenly Father we come right now in the name of Jesus and Father we ask uh, for two streams of grace one stream of grace as encouragement to those who are in the ministry or out of the ministry who are, are down and depressed at the times that we're in uh, who have allowed things to weigh on them to find encouragement from the, the, the great saints of the faith who walked through these times and found victory. And then the other grace is for those to proclaim that now is the time to repent. The judge is at the door. Judgment is about to fall. And the beginnings of it have already started. So, Father... We ask you to just give people boldness to proclaim, repent now. We pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen.